Okay, so hi everyone. So first I would like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to present my work today. And I will present to you my postdoc project which I realized in Denis Kendia team here at the CBI. So the gut epithelium is the second largest mucosal surface of the body after the lung and it, it's a single layer of cells lining crypt and villi. And it's also the fastest renewing tissue in the body. And the, complete, uh, the, the intestinal epithelium is completely renewed every three to five days. So of course, the major function of the small intestinal epithelium is the, the, the absorption of nutrients. But it's also a physical epithelial barrier between the exterior and the interior of the organisms. <coughs> and the maintenance of this barrier is crucial for homostasis. And indeed, when a breach happens, it leads to an increased permeability and may allow a toxin and pathogen to penetrate the underlying tissue. And this will lead to an immune response that can become chronic inflammation if it's not resolved and uh, leads to several pathologies such as inflammatory bowel disease and cancer. So at the cellular level, the barrier is maintained thanks to uh, junctional complexes. And there is three junctional complexes. So at the most apical side, there is a tight junction that are the one responsible for the barrier function. And they are also involved in uh, apicobasal polarity. Below, there is the adherent junction that are coupled to actomyosin belts and mechanosensitive. And finally, there is a desmosome that are coupled to intermediate filaments and ensure mechanical stability of the tissue. So as I just mentioned, uh, adherent junction are mechanosensitive and it has been shown that upon mechanical load, so when forces are increased at the junction, Ecaterin can cluster and also, uh, also other protein get recruited in order to stabilize the, the junction uh, by stabilization of the myosin network. So junctional complexes can adapt to mechanical load by reinforcement. So when we think about the intestinal barrier, we mostly think about the enterocyte, which are the absorptive cells and the major cell type of the intestinal epithelium. But there is also minor cell type, which are all secretory cells interspaced between enterocytes, such as panet cells, tough cells, enteroendocrine, and goblet cells. And here we are focusing on the second most abundant cell type of the intestinal epithelium, which are the goblet cells. So the goblet cells are responsible for the synthesis and the secretion of the mucus, which cover the entire intestinal epithelium. And it acts as, a, as an additional barrier by preventing direct contact between uh, microorganisms that are in the lumen and intestinal epithelial cells. And actually, uh, these cells acquire the name from their shapes and have a goblet shape with a round apical pole and a very bulky body full of mucus compared to uh, enterocytes, which have a polygonal apical pole and a columnar shape. So the question that we ask here is how these round and bulky cells are integrated uh, in the tissue. So first, we looked uh, in the tissue on six sections of the tissue, and we looked at the tight junction. And what you see here, it's an office view with enterocytes, which are polygonals, and goblet cells uh, round, and also without any F-actin staining, so it doesn't have a push border. And on this every scan images uh, here, you, we looked uh, closely at the tight junction around the goblet cells, and surprisingly, we found fractures in enterocyte enterocyte junction adjacent to the goblet cells. And this kind of fractures normally never happen in an LC epithelium, and we never observed it farther away from the goblet cells. So we quantified and we found that half of the goblet cells are associated with fractures in uh, neighboring uh, junctions. And again, we never observed these uh, fractures farther away from the goblet cells. So we, con we call this phenomenon goblet cell associated fractures or GAFs. So most of the time, goblet cells are surrounded by at least several rows of enterocytes. But sometimes it can happen that goblet cells are in close proximity and separated only by one enterocyte. And in that case, actually, we observe that the fracture is bigger. And uh, when we quantified, indeed, we found that we have a huge increase of fracture area when two goblets are in close proximity, meaning, meaning that we have a cumulative, goblet cells have a cumulative effect on GAFs. And finally, to further characterize uh, these fractures, we, uh, we assess the permeability of the tight junction. And to do that, we stain for accessible ecalerin. So briefly, uh, if the tight junction is intact, the antibody cannot go through. 
But if the tight junction is broken, the antibody can go through and label the accessible Icarewin. So we did this kind of staining and uh, we found that we have signal only around the goblet cells and never uh, farther away from these cells, meaning that indeed the tight junctions are broken around the goblet cells. So all this characterization was meant in vivo where there is a lot of factors, including uh, notably muscles, immune system, microbiota. So in order to simplify uh, the model and to have a better idea of what is happening and to assess if the fractures are epithelium autonomous or not, we use an in vitro model and we use 3D organoids, I mean, we use organoids where only epithelial cells are present. And to obtain organoids, we isolate intestinal crypts and we embed them in matrigel. And in few hours, the crypt will close on itself and start to proliferate and differentiate. And after a few days of differentiation, we obtain a fully mature organoid, which retain uh, cell heterogeneity and self-organization in crypt uh, and villus-like structure. But the major limit of this model for our study is that we don't have any access to the apical side. So in order to improve the in vitro model, we used 2D organoids. Uh, so to obtain 2D organoids, we break the 3D organoid and we sit them on top of a glass, coated glass cover slip. An organoid will form a monolayer, which retain also uh, cell heterogeneity and self-organization. As you can see here, we have densely packed area that are proliferative and corresponding to the crypt-like uh, region. And between this crypt-like region, there is differentiated area, stand here with villain, that are the villi-like compartment. So in this 2D organoid, we looked at uh, goblet cells and uh, the tight junction. Uh, and as you can see here, we find that actually even in 2D monolayer, goblet cells uh, are associated with fractures in neighboring cells. And similarly to in vivo, we found that half of the goblet cells are associated with fractures. So 2D organoids can replicate the GAFs, meaning that actually fractures are epithelium autonomous. And another advantage of organoids is that they are really easy to manipulate. And by playing with signaling pathway, we can actually force stem cells and force the fate of stem cells and force them to become goblet cells. So we did it in 3D and we can see that after a few days of differentiation, we have a huge increase of uh, goblet cells in the organoids. So we have a goblet hyperplasia. And we did it also in 2D, and in that case, again, we have an increase of goblet number, but we also measure the mucus volume, and we can see that we have an increase of uh, goblet cell volume. So we have goblet hyperplasia and hypertrophy. And we looked at the fractures in these uh, two conditions, and we can see that when the goblets are bigger, we actually have uh, increase of fractures area. So now we are currently uh, investigating how the fractures are formed and as fractures uh, probably result from mechanical challenges, we are investigating two kinds of forces. And uh, the first one is uh, actomyosin contractility and the pulling forces on the junction. And the second one is uh, the pushing and the pressure of the goblet cells that is so big that it, can, it may push on the neighbors. So, as I mentioned in the introduction, adrenal junction are mechanosensitive and can reinforce upon mechanical load by clustering of ecaterin. Uh, so we looked at adrenal junction in vivo on six section uh, of uh, tissue again. And the first thing is uh, we saw that we have rarely fractures at this level. But what we see, it's a huge increase of ecaterin in goblet adjacent junction. And when we look closely, we can see that this enrichment is heterogeneous along the junction. And we see a progressive increase of ecaterin towards the goblet cells. So for us, it means that these junctions actually feel tension and that the goblet cells are mechanically challenging their neighbors. So we looked also in, um, in organoid, in 2D organoid, and similarly to in vivo, we observed an increase of uh, ecaterin in goblet adjacent junction, meaning that even in 2D monolayer, goblet cells can challenge the tissue. 
So to further uh, assess the role of the tissue tension, we use an ex vivo uh, model where we are able to culture uh, tissue explants for a few hours and to treat it with inhibitors. And here we treat uh, the tissue with blebistatin, which inhibit myosin 2 activity and we monitor the fractures. And we can see that when we inhibit uh, tissue tension, we have actually a decrease of fractures area. And we also uh, did it in vivo, where we deplete uh, myosin 2A using an inducible uh, knockout mice model. And here, uh, similarly, we have a decrease uh, of fractures area. So when we inhibit the global tissue tension, we have a partial decrease of the GAFs, meaning that tissue contractility participate, at least, to the appearance of the fractures, but it's not the only factor. So we also assess if there is any cytoskeleton rearrangement, and we looked at the intermediate filaments with uh, CK8 uh, staining. And here we can see that we have a strong enrichment of CK8 in uh, goblet cell adjacent enterocyte. And we can see that this enrichment is really toward the goblet cells and mostly at the apical side, as we can see here on the orthogonal views. So for, uh, for us, it means that the first neighbors, the, gob the goblet cell neighbors, actually respond to the presence of the goblet cells. And that maybe these first neighbors are mechanically, mechanically different than the second neighbors. So now we are currently uh, investigating the mechanical properties of the tissue. And to do that, we are uh, optimizing two techniques. And uh, the first one is the uh, optical tweezers uh, developed here by Thomas Manja, and uh, in which by trapping a lipid vesicle inside, inside the cell and make it move and assessing how the cell, the lipid vesicle return to the, to the position, we can evaluate the mechanical property of uh, the cell inside the tissue. And so we did a first experiment and I will show you a few examples of what we were able to, to do. So here we were able actually to trap a vesicle and to push it again uh, against uh, the goblet cell cortex in, uh, and to probe actually the goblet cell cortex. And we were also able to, uh, to trap a vesicle inside the cytoplasm of the first neighbor in order to maybe measure the viscosity. And similarly, we did in the second neighbors of the, of the goblet cells. So the idea with this technique is here to map the cortex rigidity of the cells regarding uh, the goblet position inside the, the tissue. And the second approach that we are uh, currently developing is uh, atomic force microscopy with Etienne Dag and Cecil Formosa at last. And for AFM, uh, here we are using 2D organoids and uh, we want to assess uh, the, the mechanical property of the cortex from above since we will probe with a cantilever. So here it's a bright field image of what we uh, measure. So this is the cantilever and the goblet cell is here. And we were able to uh, make a measurement at low resolution of the goblet cell rigidity and of the neighbors. And uh, we also used a higher resolution image to probe the enterocyte junction around the goblet cells. So the idea with this technique is to map junctions and apical cortex around the goblet cells. So to conclude, we saw that goblet cells are associated with fractures in tissue homostasis and that these cells are mechanically challenging the tissue. And thanks to organoids, we thought that uh, goblets, the fractures are epithelium autonomous and that goblet hypertrophy is, uh, leads to an increase of GAFs area, suggesting actually an effect of the pressure. And regarding the forces, we are now thinking that both kind of forces, pulling and pushing, are actually involved and connected, and that pushing from below, resulting from the mucus volume, is actually resulting and in, uh, inducing uh, an uh, pulling at the apical site. So now we are currently uh, investigating the characterization of the mechanical properties of the tissue uh, by developing few tools, uh, such as optical tweezers, AFM, or laser ablation. And we are also working with physicists that are uh, developing a bio biophysical model to understand uh, how the balance uh, forces, uh, how the forces are balanced at the, at the junction and how it leads to, uh, to the appearance of the fractures. 
So I would like to thank the, all the members of my team and all the people that participate to this work. So uh, Edouard Anezo and Chile for the basi uh, biophysical model, Tatiana and uh, Magali for laser ablation, Etienne Dag and Cecile Formosa for AFM and Thomas for the optical tweezers. And thank you for your attention. Thank you.